Hello and welcome back. My name is Larry Machado. Once again, your host for Sandwich Fire Department today. With me today, I have a guest, Sean Miller. He's our fire prevention officer, also known as the FPO for short. Some people refer to Sean as the fire inspector. He does it all. Sean, um, along with fire prevention, you're also our council on aging liaison. That's correct. I so, work for the council on aging. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? You started here as a dispatcher in Sandwich, correct? I started as a dispatcher in Sandwich in 1994. Uh, moved to the floor in 1999. Uh, just currently came onto the FPO office uh, six months ago. Excellent. So when we say move to the floor, for the people at home who's not sure about that, that means going from an administrative position uh, to the actual people who show up at your house, whether it's a firefighter or an officer, whatever it is. So the floor in our terms means that they're going out and actually doing the work. So um, as a fire prevention officer, um, one of the key things you do is the Council on Agent, Agent Liaison. I knew I was going to mess that one up, but that's okay. <laughs> um, explain a little bit about what your job is with that as far as from the fire department to the Council on Agent. How do you handle What do you do? Uh, well, we work hand-in-hand -hand with the Council on Aging. If there's ever a problem with anyone who needs any type of assistance uh, for the elderly in the town, uh, with Knox boxes, uh, making sure that they're taken care of in any regards to trip safety. We do, can do inspections of their house, come in and make sure they have carbon, working carbon monoxide detectors, working CO detector, um, excuse me, smoke detectors. And we can even supply those uh, to people that are in need. Um, we can even supply some new products that are out in the market called uh, safety lights. And what that is is a night light that plugs into the wall. And when the smoke detector goes off, it becomes 10 times brighter and it indicates anybody that has any type of hard of hearing or hearing impairment that there's a smoke detector going off in their house and it can also illuminate the area better for them. Oh, that's nice. So it's, it's kind of like um, in a restaurant when you see the flashing light as well as the audio signal when the alarm goes off in a restaurant or a commercial building, you get that eh, eh, and then yep. you have the light flash and for the heart, uh, heart of um, hearing so they can actually That's correct. see what's going on. Yep. So we do have that now for the house. Yes. And where can they get those if they wanted one of those? We have some in our supply, but they uh, do supply them at all the hardware stores. They just uh, they just came out about a year ago. All right, so if we're looking to get one, you can actually check in with Sean to see if he has any at the station. That would be, um, you can call 508-888-0525 and press four. Yes. And you'll get either Lisa, our administrative assistant, or the fire prevention officer, or the EMS officer, Sean Gilrain, which we spoke to last time. So, um, moving on, you spoke about Knox boxes. That's a good thing. What is a Knox box? Uh, Knox box is a, basically a metal box that can be attached to the house. Uh, they come in several different types of shapes and sizes. Um, they can hold anywhere from one key for a very small house to a large box that holds multiple keys for a business or a commercial um, uh, entity. And what it is, is um, we carry the keys in the trucks that are assigned to a locked cabinet. And when a person comes that needs to, we need to enter a building, we enter a code in, which is usually the last four of the firefighter's social security number. And it tracks when that key has been taken out and the location that it's been taken out and where it's been used. And we can enter the building without having to break down any doors, break any windows. Um, it's a town bylaw that's required by anybody that has any type of um, fire alarm or medical alarm in the town or any commercial business. Okay, so whether I have a business or I have a home in town, if I have an alarm that uh, detects fire, a smoke alarm that's hardwired and goes back to an answering service and they contact the fire department direct, it's a bylaw in this town that I have to have one of those Knox boxes. Yes, Okay. and that so, also includes medical alarms also. Medical alarms as well, all right, thank you. So the thing that I have is a lot of people ask me about that uh, when we go out and respond and we talk about having a Knox box for their house, their biggest concern is uh, security, their security, it's their domain, nobody belongs in there. Um, and I try to explain, as you did, that every time a key is taken out of our engine or ambulance or a patrol vehicle for a Knox box to unlock the one on their house so we can gain entrance, it's recorded, as you said, by mm -hmm. the last four digits of the user's social um, and the location so we can track it and the time it gets put back. So there really is no security issue there. The biggest security issue is not having one and is seeing something that may lead us to believe there's a problem. Now we have to do damage to the, to the door, the window, or some, something to that house to gain entry to make sure the person is safe, whether it's a medical alarm or a fire. That's correct. Okay. 
So the Knox boxes are a good thing. And they can get that information on our website? They can get it on our website from the Council on Aging, and they can also contact me at my office. We have the forms, and they can also go to uh, the website and order them there also. Okay, so if you want to contact Sean directly, you can contact him by email at S Miller, that's S M I L L E R, at townofsandwich.net, or you can call that phone number again at 508 888 0525 and press 4 to get his extension. Um, what else do you want to tell? We were talking about residential inspections. Uh, residential inspections, when you go out to do a house inspection, why do you go out to do a house inspection? First of all, let's stop there. The primary time that we go out for doing any type of residential inspection is going to be for a residential resale. Um, anytime you're um, going to sell your house, it has to be inspected uh, by the fire department. We come out and make sure it has working smoke detectors and working CO detectors in the house. And if it uh, is built after a certain year, it has to have working heat detectors in the garage. Um, we base this on the year that the house was built or any major additions that were added to the house, such as a bedroom or a large addition over 1,200 square feet. Excellent. So as a citizen in Sandwich, if I'm not sure if my house is up to code, so, so to speak, according to when it was built, because I just bought it from somebody and maybe I did a little renovations on my own, um, can I call the station and see if you have, can set up an appointment to maybe come out and take a look and just let me know if there's something I should uh, maybe change or do differently or add a smoke detector here or something to that Certainly, plan. yeah, we'll be more than glad to come out set up an appointment. We can come out and check your house, make sure it's safe, uh, make sure the working detectors. Detectors are only good for 10 years. After 10 years, they have to be replaced and the new detectors on the market, most of them come with a 10 year uh, built in battery now. So it makes life even easier for you so you don't have to check the batteries every year, but you should still test those detectors once a year. But we'll come out and we'll check them, make sure they're working, make sure they're up to date, and make sure you have CO detectors in the house. Okay. Now you say 10-year uh, expiration date. 10 years on, I have a, a, I have a smoke detector and I have um, um, a carbon monoxide detector, two separate detectors. Are they both 10 years or is the smoke 10 years and the carbon monoxide a different year or vice versa? Or how does it work? It depends on the brand. Um, if you read the packaging, most of them will explain it on the packaging. But most, in general, most detectors are good. For, smoke detectors are good for 10 years, and most carbon monoxide detectors are good for seven years. Um, mm -hmm. If they're a combo unit, it should say it on the package whether it's good for seven or 10. Excellent. That was my next question: was the combos. Um, I often am asked, "What's the best CO detector I can buy on the market?" And it's actually a matter of choice. Personally, my preference: I like to tell people if you take. The smoke detector, which is mounted up high, you get a combination that's great. It's always good to have one of the plug-in units that has a digital display. The digital display will uh, let you know uh, by, by putting LB would be low battery, or if you actually have a, a CO leak, it'll give a number for pots per million. That number is very valuable so that if you call and you have the alarm going off and you call the fire department and you tell the dispatcher my smoke detector or my CO detector is going off, and my CO detector is reading 33. What does that mean? They're going to tell you, just gather up your, 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 your kids, uh, family members, get a phone, get out of the house, close the door, don't open up any windows, and the fire department will come out. When we come out, we, check, we have a meter, a four gas meter, and we go ahead and look at your house, walk around and try to find that leak. Right. Okay. Yep. So it really doesn't matter what type you have as long as you have some kind of warning device. Right. People get confused a lot with the batteries, I mean with the, um, the beeps with these things here. Generally, can you explain a little bit about what the beeping pattern is and what it means to a person? Well, a lot of the new detectors, especially combination units, are going to be a, a voice activated detector. So they're going to, it's going to say fire if a fire detector, detection system is going off or it's mm -hmm. going to say CO. And it's going to tell you the parts per million in a voice recognized um, system. So basically, you're going to have your smoke detector Smoke detectors are going to beep, they're not going to talk. Carbon monoxide detectors are going to be a different type and they're going to beep and they're not going to talk on this type of brand. But the combination units, most of them are talking now. So if you have a problem with it, it's going to say fire or it's going to say CO and tell you what, what type of problem it is. They even gone to the extent where you can program them to say where the problem is. Um, with combination detectors, if you um, wire them together, they'll even tell you that it's in the lobby or it's in the kitchen or it's in the basement. Okay, excellent. So if I'm sitting at home and my smoke detector gives me a beep and then there's a period of 
a minute or so, two minutes or so, and it beeps again. And then a minute or two goes by and it beeps again. It's uh, more of kind of being a nuisance to me. What is that telling me? It could be a low battery problem with the detector. It could be a problem with the detector actually it's getting to its year, 10 years and it's having a problem. Um, first thing to do is check the detector, check the battery, test the battery, see if it's any good anymore, replace it with a new one, clean the detector out. You can vacuum your detector with a vacuum, make sure there's no cobwebs or any dirt or dust that's accumulated in, especially in the basements. Try that, if it's still beeping, you can give the fire department a call and we'll come out and make sure it's not a problem in the house. And then you can contact an electrician if it's a problem with a hardwire detector. Excellent. I found most of the times, um, and people don't like to see it, but most of the times the problem that we're having with a lot of false alarms on smoke detectors is spiders and spider webs getting up inside there. And you take your detector down, you vacuum it out, and off you go. Now, when you take your detector down, if you're getting a series of beeps intermittently, a lot of the new ones on the back of the detector will tell you one beep every 30 seconds means this. Right. One beep every 10 seconds means this. A continuous beeping is normally an alarm in any detector. Right. So that's something to keep in mind. And uh, if you're not sure, if you can reach it, take it down and take a look at the, what that beeping says according to that particular manufacturer. If not, again, like Sean said, give us a call. We'll come out and take a look at it. We have no problems with that. We love coming out and helping people. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the residential. How about commercial inspections? What do you do with commercial inspections? Commercial inspections depend on the entity itself. Um, if it's a, a hardware store or a you know, grocery store or even the mom and pop's little um, you know, convenience store. store, variety store. Basically, we're doing the same exact thing we're doing at a um, residential inspection. We're going to make sure they have working smoke detectors. We're making sure that their alarm system's functioning, that their exits and egresses are clear. Uh, they're not storing any chemicals or um, propane or any type of, of um, flammables that are uh, over the abundance that limit that they're supposed to have. We make sure that everything is in accordance to the code and law of uh, Massachusetts. And from there on out, we work, work with them in hand in hand to make sure that they, they're compliant. Excellent. So uh, that's a good thing. Whether it's a residential uh, infraction or violation or commercial infraction or violation, our main goal is not to go out there and start writing tickets and charging people. Our main goal is to work with people. Is that, I mean, That's correct. We're of the same mindset with that, yeah. um, as well as our administration, the chief and deputy. We, we are not in this business to, to, vi to, to create violations or to, to write you up for violations. We want to make sure it's safe for you, the, public the homeowner, the, 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 the business owner, the patrons that are going in there, and us as firefighters. I mean, let's face it, if we've got to go in there for whatever reason, we want to make sure we can get our, our men and women in and out safely. Correct. So that's, that's what the whole thing's about. It's not about, um, oh, you got a violation and we're going to write you up here and that's going to cost you X amount of money. No, we're not about that. And no. Um, no, none of the inspectional services in town, uh, I believe, are like that. No. I've worked with several of them, gas, electrical, uh, building, and everybody's on the same page. We want to help the, the citizens of the community to make sure it's a safer community for everybody. Yeah, we work hand in hand with the building department. A lot of our commercial inspections are done with the building department now. So we have two inspectors going out. Um, the building inspectors there are looking for, uh, he's making sure the egress and entrance ways are up to their code, stairwells, and I'm looking for the fire codes to make sure that there's not a problem with the, our violation of the fire code. Okay, excellent. Uh, Overcapacity is another big one, uh, kind of a soft subject at some point. So we're just gonna briefly talk about that and uh, let it go. <laughs> Who actually governs the overcapacity? Who decides how many people you can have in this room for a commercial, we're talking about commercial buildings now, a restaurant. Uh, how do I determine in my restaurant how many people can be in my dining room? Occupancy reports usually handled by the building department. They come out and they'll do a measurement of the building and they have a, um, a formula they use to figure out how many people they can have in that, in that room, whether it's sitting, standing, or whatever type of um, occupancy it is. Then it's up to uh, the fire department to enforce it. Um, we can make sure, uh, especially since um, a lot of tragedies we've had in the past where we've had overcrowding, you can go back to the 1940s, the Coconut Grove fire, you can go mm -hmm. back to 2003, which was the uh, nightclub fire. Uh, in Rhode Island and where we've had tragedies in the past that's where we unfortunately learn from and we manage that from there. So um, good we look at you said station nightclub fire uh, actually on ironically we're filming this today on February 22nd 2018 and the station nightclub fire was February 20th 2003 
So uh, yeah, that that's keeps coming back every year uh, in the back of a lot of people's minds. And the biggest pot there with 100 people dying was the exit and, and the lack of uh, ability that people had to get out that exit. It was a very narrow hallway. Um, There's a lot of people. So impressing upon commercial and um, restaurant owners, nightclub owners, or commercial business owners, it's not that people can get back to that exit. It's the amount of people you have in that room and how many exits they can get to. Correct. Because I mean, let's face it, if you get the, most people will always exit in an emergency the same way they came into a building right. or into a room. So as firefighters, a lot of firefighters do this, and, and we're taught this in the academy. We come in, and, and my wife, she's always busting my chops about it, but first thing I'm doing, I said, I want my back to the wall, and I want to look around. I want to see where all my exits are. And she's like, what, what's the matter with you? And knock on wood, nothing's ever happened that I've been involved in, but it's through all the training that we go through, and we see that if everybody goes back to the same place we came in, you're going to have... 50, 60 people trying to get out a 36 inch door. Yeah, you have and a bottleneck, which, which happens. And that's why resident, um, commercial buildings are supposed to have multiple exits. And they have the illuminated signs over them to tell people that there's an exit. And if the fire alarm does go off or the emergency lights do come on, those illuminated signs will still be lit to tell you that that's the exit you can choose to go to. So that's why we have multiple exits in, bu in buildings. Excellent. Yeah, when you said bottleneck, uh, if I remember correctly, the majority of the people in the station nightclub fire didn't die because they were burned to death or they had smoke inhalation. It was because a lot of them were trampled. Yep. As you get into the exits, people are panicking. They're trying to get out that exit. Yeah. And um, that, that's a big problem. So like you said, um, it, it, it's, it's tough. You got to look at those exits and make sure they're accommodating to the people that are in the building. Yep. Now, um, we talked a little bit about uh, residential. We talked a little bit about commercial inspections and we touched on the fire. Uh, station nightclub fire. While we're on inspections, before we leave this, and I go back to our uh, fire safety for seniors, uh, what about fire lanes? Um, I just want to drop somebody off. They're just running into the grocery store. I'm going to park my car here in the fire lane. Can I do that? No. Fire lanes have meant to be kept open for emergency vehicles. If we have any type of problem, we're gonna, that's where the fire trucks are going to be coming up to pull up to do any type of uh, work or any type of um, operations. Okay, you know, we, if we have to do any, use any tools, if we have to use any hose lines, we want to have that lane open there because that way we have close proximity to the building. But I'm in my car, I can just pull away if, if the fire, if the house catches, uh, the, the restaurant or the, the grocery store catches fire or the school, I can just drive away. No, oh, well, there's a <laughs> lot of, it's still a violation. We shouldn't be doing it. It shouldn't make it, you shouldn't make it that your parking spot. You know, when we go out to do our, um, stuff that we do, we don't park in the fire lane either. We park in parking spots and then we walk to the building if we have to do an inspection. And it's not designed for firefighters to park in, it's designed for fire apparatus during emergencies. Okay. Um, just, just as a note to go out, um, I know the high school is working diligently with their security personnel there and Officer Cabral um, and Officer Bonderic, the uh, school resource officers. Um, so if you're watching and, you, and you're going to the school, the high school, as a parent to pick up or drop off a child during school hours or after school hours, it's very important, as we just stated, to please don't block that fire lane. Uh, if we have to come in there just to, with an ambulance, it's not only just because of a fire uh, or access for a fire truck, but our ambulances have to get in and out of there. We're in and out of the schools quite often. Kids mm -hmm. are tripping, they're falling, they're having asthma attacks, they're having allergic reactions. Um, anything can happen there, um, or, or, or even one of the, um, the teachers. So it's important to keep those fire lanes clean, uh, clear, please. Um, let's go back to uh, the liaison for Council on Aging. We talked about uh, one of the big things you, you are a big advocate for is uh, even before you got into this role of fire prevention officer and fire inspector and liaison is safety. I, I know, uh, and a lot of people out there may not know, but Sean used to volunteer a lot of his time uh, doing school talks, um, demonstrations with the kids over at the wing school um, and the different schools throughout the town and 
kind of bringing our children up to speed on what they should do in the event of a fire emergency. And now you move into this position and you're doing the same thing actively with the seniors. Yep. What, what are some of the programs you have going on? We have on? two. Um, we have what's called the SAFE grants. Um, we have a junior SAFE grant, which is for going into the schools and teaching. Um, we can use that to hire firefighters um, to come in. Uh, we have approximately about $4,000 a year that we can use to hire firefighters to come in and do demonstration for us, uh, to buy products for dem uh, demonstrations. Uh, we have what's called the Hazard House that we bring in to teach younger kill, uh, children. It's basically a small dollhouse that has electricity that runs through it, lights, um, it shows smoke and smoke travel. So we can do a visual demonstration because uh, children really get hands-on demonstrations a lot better than just by us talking to them. If we can show them something visually or show them hands-on, like letting them touch the equipment, letting them uh, hold a fire helmet, they get more of an understanding of what we're talking about. Then we also have what's called the Senior Safe Program, and we get about approximately $2,500 a year for that. And what I do with that is I go out and I buy products like oven mitts that we can donate to them and give to them. And it teaches about, can we explain cooking safety at the same time as we're giving this out. Um, then we can give out the lights, we can give out the uh, smoke detectors and the carbon monoxide detectors. We try to keep a good uh, 10 to 15 of each a product in the station at all times. So if I have a problem that I need to go out and give somebody some smoke detectors because they don't have working detectors in their houses, we can supply that product right away. Excellent. So these grants are federal, state, what are Federal they? and state. So federal grants of 4,000 for the for youth one and 2,500 or so for the uh, senior one, that has absolutely, just to reiterate, has nothing to do with our budget. That no. comes from grants that you, the deputy and the chief put together, submit, Hopefully we get approved, usually we do, because we've got some pretty good writers on our department. We get approved for these grants, and now we can go ahead and help the public a little bit better than we yep. do already. Yes. So um, what about these magnets here you've got? We talked, uh, one magnet is about fire safety, and it talks about freight electrical cords and other things that seniors should look out for, trip and fall hazards. Um, these are also available at the station. Yep, it's another product that we, um, that we purchased this year. Um, this is, the larger one is for senior safety, uh, it basically goes out through a checklist of what a senior should do in their house to make sure that they have things in accordance to what's making their house safe. Uh, the smaller one is basically the um, generic test your smoke alarms so we can make sure that everyone tests their smoke alarm and they can check off the month that they do it. We try to do it every uh, two times a year. You try, every time you change your clocks, you should be checking the batteries in your smoke detectors. Right. Okay, yes. I'm glad you expelled on that. You, uh, we mentioned earlier, at least once a year, you need to do a check on your smoke detectors. We prefer you do it twice a year when you change your clocks, yep. change your batteries and your smokes, and give them a test. Yep. Um, another thing we talk to the kids and the seniors about is very important, is making sure you have a meeting place. If you have an emergency in your house and you have to exit for a CO detector or activation, for a smoke alarm or an actual fire, where are you gonna go? So your neighbors are, or the rest of your family knows where you're gonna be. So a meeting place is another big important thing. Yeah, well, uh, one of the, one of the um, skills that we teach the kids in schools is called an escape plan. And it's basically, we give them a little map and they can go home and they can draw an, uh, all the rooms in their house and all the exits in their house. And they bring it back in the next day. And what we do is we show them how to make an escape plan out of that. Show them what's the best way of getting out of their house from every room in their house. And then they pick a point that's out front of their house that's always going to be there, whether it be a tree or a rock or their mailbox. It's something that's always going to be there and that's going to be their meeting place. You're not going to pick mom and dad's car because if mom and dad yep. leave for work, <laughs> you don't have your meeting place anymore. So you're going to pick something that's always there. All right. Excellent. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about or mention or get out there? I know I have a couple of things. If not, all right. So uh, just to reiterate on a few of our uh, things we've talked about in the past, we did a, a recent uh, public service announcement. We went to a smoke detector activation a couple of weeks ago and um, I learned from the gas company when uh, Cindy showed up from the gas company that um, they are selling oven drip mats or okay. oven drip pads, however they're, they're expressing them. You can get them at Christmas tree shop, you can get them at appliance stores and they're great great tools for people to use. They put them in the bottom of the oven and it catches all the drippings from that turkey dinner so it doesn't create a big uh, grease pit in the bottom of your oven again a fire safe a fire hazard and when it gets dirty they take them out and they throw them in the dishwasher clean it all up and they put it back in and it's all set and the oven stays nice and clean mom i know mom loves that but the problem that they're having is they're selling generic mats of different sizes it's extremely important that you as a homeowner if you purchase one of these mats you take them home and you look at the bottom of your oven if you're going to put them on the bottom of the oven 
you have to make sure that the vent holes in the oven are not covered. If you cover those vent holes, it creates a carbon monoxide situation. And uh, in this particular uh, situation, we had levels of 45 in the kitchen when we just walked in the door. We exited, got our air on, came back, and we started doing some researches to find out what it was. Put the meter in that oven, when we turned it on with the mat on, within 30 seconds, it was up to 100 parts per million. Yeah, right? yeah they're having a lot of problems with those, um, with the gas stoves. Hopefully, um, they're going to change the product where you, it says to either trim the mat or give the sizes that you know what to get. Excellent. And um, I know some people have concerns about hoarding out there. Hoarding is not really our issue. Uh, we like to know about it. Uh, to each their own, their own domain, I understand that. But if you have a situation in your neighborhood or a friend, neighbor, family member that you think is hoarding and it's unsafe for them, if it's unsafe for them to be there, it's gonna be unsafe for us to get in there. So how can somebody go about reporting a hoarding incident or to have somebody look into a hoarding incident? They can contact us or the police and usually it's the Board of Health that gets involved with more of the hoarding issues. Um, we uh, really just watch for um, excess of fire load okay. you know that would be one of the things that we can do anything about but more it's a um, board of health issue excellent so that's about all we have time for today i guess um just to reiterate a few of our things don't forget smoke detectors are available if you need them contact sean via email that you see on the screen or the phone number and uh he'll see what he can do to help you out with the smoke detectors and co and these great new lights that he has um oven mitts are also available you have these magnets for you Check them out. They give you a, a nice little checklist so you can uh, make sure everything's set. Be careful um, out there. It's still cold, still black ice. If you're going to the mailbox, please bring a phone with you, a cell phone or um, a cordless phone. We've had people slip and fall in the snow and the ice and haven't been found for two or three hours later. Um, no one's home. So uh, one poor gentleman decided to say, uh, it's been three hours since my wife went to go get her mail. Where is she? and finally found her. So um, it's, uh, it's extremely important you make sure you take care of yourself. Um, Knox boxes are a great thing. Oven mats are very nice and very uh, useful. Make sure you do them the right way. Make sure they're properly installed. Um, that's all we have time for today. And thanks for coming, Sean. Anytime. All right.